Oh, right. So we're sitting here in the shop. It's pretty late in the evening. Uh, thunderstorm rolling in. And I was looking at my comments earlier. Uh, this chair is squeaking rather loudly, so forgive that. But anyway, I don't know what the world that's about. Anyway, uh, a couple of y'all have suggested uh, a couple topics to hear the Ray Clay Traveler ramble about some history, and I greatly appreciate it. So the first uh, feller uh, wants to hear about uh, timber cutting and uh, tree cutting and stuff, like in colonial days involving uh, the industry leading up to um, you know, like the revolution. It's a fantastic topic, but I've got to do some more research on it. Another feller uh, wants to hear about John North Willis and about the history of AMC, which I think are dandy ideas. So this is going to be a standalone video about John North Willis. <clears throat> now, normally I do these kind of talks just from memory, but John North Willis has a bit of a storied life and he's got a lot of moving parts. So I do have uh, a little bit of a script here, mainly just for the dates and the names of the companies that were acquired that eventually made Willis Overland. Now, a little side note here. Do you say Willis or do you say Willis? Well, from everything I've read, um, John North Willis would have pronounced his name Willis. Even though it's spelled W-I-L-L-Y-S, so people will say Willies, he apparently pronounced it Willis. Now, old-timers, when talking about Willies trucks or cars or whatever, they'll call them Willis. Um, but modern-day people call them Willies, and that's just as acceptable, too. John North Willis isn't alive to, to give us any trouble over it, so... I think you'd understand. Um, <clears throat> most of this information that I've gathered came from an article that was wrote for um, Hemings, uh, yeah, Hemings Magazine, which is you know, classic cars and stuff, Hemings. Um, and it was wrote by a man named Thomas A. Dumaro in 2016. Now, I'm not going to just read it to you. I'm just using it as a reference because there's so many dates and so many companies that were acquired that formed into what would be uh, Willis Overland. So, but basically, to get started with, um, John North Willis is born in New York in 1873. His father is a brick and tile mason. Um, from what I can understand, he didn't come from necessarily dirt poor, but he didn't come from like a high up family either. They were just kind of all right. Um, We'll just call him Willis, just to make it easy, so instead of saying his full name every time. He uh, apparently was a spirited young man, and he had a drive that was kind of unusual, you know. Um, and by the time he was, you know, in his teens, he was buying and selling and building bicycles. So that's what he got started with. He was buying bicycles, selling bicycles, and ultimately building bicycles. He ended up buying a... Um, Let's see, in 1898, he ended up buying a, uh, a fledgling sporting goods store, which is where he kind of based his bicycle business out of. And he starts doing this in the 1890s, uh, I think late 1880s, early 1890s, and he's doing this pretty successfully. And by 1900, it's recorded that he did close to uh, $500,000 worth of sales just with bicycles, which that's a, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money now. But that was an even lot more significant amount of money in 1900. Now, I don't know if that figure is accurate. I saw different figures for how much he made selling bicycles and stuff. But either way, it, it was lucrative. Um, in 1899, he saw an automobile for the first time. And when he saw this automobile for the first time, you got to remember, 18, late 1890s, there's just virtually no automobiles around. I mean, there's basically nothing. Nobody's making them. There's very few. Um, the first vehicle that you could truly call a automobile loosely is is not that old yet. So 1899, you're talking the, the existence of what we would refer to as an automobile has only been around, you know, 15, 20 years. That's if you count the early 
tricycle models of cars that Ben's made and stuff like that. Anyway, um, so he sees this car and he says basically to himself, this is going to obsolete, make bicycles obsolete, or more or less. And so he decides to, to start working his way into the auto industry. So this is where all the dates and stuff have to come in because <clears throat> there's just too much of it going on for me to be able to uh, to keep up with. It's kind of like the formation of GM. If you look at the formation of GM, that there's so much going on that it's just impossible <laughs> to keep track of. Uh, let's see. So in 1906, he formed American Motor Car Sales Company of New York. Um, and he was contracted with, with uh, Overland Motor Car Company, um, which was a division of Standard Wheel Company. So Overland Motor Car or Automotive Division was under the Standard Wheel Company. And he contracted with them basically to sell cars for them and to wholesale 500 cars, which was Overland's entire projected production for 1906. Basically what happens is, is he gets in there and he's so good at selling cars that he sells more than is projected for Overland to even make. Now Overland is extremely uh, on the ropes here. Like they're, they're in financial trouble, they're in significant debt, they're not doing that good, but they made a quality vehicle and Willie's or Willis wants to to sell their product. Well, he's too good at it, so he sells more than Overland was even capable of making. So basically, he sells all the ones that they're they're projected to make plus some, and he calls Overland and he says, "Like, listen, you're going to have to bump up production." And Overland says, I, "You know, we can't. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. We're in debt. We can't do it." They're actually right on the verge of receivership, they're just about to just go away. And so Overland comes up uh, basically to the point where you know we can't make any more cars. So Mr. Willis here has a solution for that. So he basically takes control of the Overland car division, of the Overland car company. Basically he takes control of it and when they asked him about this later, they said, why, you know, what, what prompted you to do this? And this is a quote. That's another reason why I have this is because it's got some quotes from his. They asked him this in 1920, and this is what he said. He said, the failure of that company, which would be referencing Overland car manufacturing, he said, the failure of that company meant the loss of my income. It meant that I must start all over again. But worst of all, it meant that I must break my promise to several hundred customers who expected the delivery of cars. So that's something you'll see kind of consistently with uh, Mr. Willis here is that he, yeah, he's, uh, he's driven by money, he's driven by building an empire, but he's also driven by the notion that you need to deliver on the vehicles that you promise, you need to deliver the best vehicle that you can and revolutionize vehicles, make them better, every rendition of them. So he, he's big on that. And he, he influences the whole industry because of that. He informed Willie's Overland uh, that he was willing to basically generate the money that they needed to pay for payroll because one of the biggest problems they had was they didn't have enough money for payroll. And they were, it varies on what you read, but they were anywhere from 400 to, to $600 low on payroll, which at the time uh, in 1907 would be close to nine grand. So that's a significant amount of money that they just don't have. So Willis basically says, listen, I'll give you the money. You can pay your employees. And then he works his way into taking control of the company. He, he becomes president, all this. So also the other thing that was hitting Overland extremely hard was 1907 was the year of what they called the big panic, which was basically like a, uh, uh, a pretty serious recession or panic among bankers and the investment market and everything. And so people were not willing to lend money. So Overland couldn't just go get a loan. So like, hey, we're an auto manufacturer, we need money. 
like people are, are extremely weary about giving money. There's a series of depressions and recessions prior to the Great Depression that hit in 29 that you very rarely hear about because the Great Depression overshadows all of those smaller depressions and recessions. The other thing hitting, so you got, they're short on payroll, they're short um, on lenders because they can't get any lenders because of the panic of 1907. And the other problem is, is they're $80,000 in debt in 1907, which is a freakish amount of money to be in debt at that time. I wouldn't want to be $80,000 in debt right now, but that's a lot, 1907. So basically, they're in a position where they can't tell Mr. Willis no. They just can't. They just can't turn this down, basically. And he's not offering it in a way to put them out of business. He's not trying to change anything. He's trying to save the company, basically. So he uh, became president and general manager in 1908. And over 400 cars were produced that year. And then in 1909, due to his leadership, they produced 4,000 cars. So they went from 400 cars to 4,000 cars in basically a year, which is a pretty, pretty hardcore uptick in production. The, the plant was small enough to where they had to build circus tents. They rented these big circus tents so that they could move some, some of the production out of the main factory so they could keep up production on the automobiles. Um, and he was able to bring Overland back to profitability. And in 1909 is one of the first purchases that he does under his leadership is when he buys the Marion Motor Car Company uh, that he bought in 1909. Now this is where you start seeing um, just like an endless stream of purchases of other companies. Basically he would buy fledgling car companies because they had one good thing that they liked. So he liked one thing that they made, so he'd buy them so he could get the rights to that, and then he'd produce that and into Overland cars and eventually what would be Willie's Overland automobiles. So they're running out of space because of the production goes up so much, so they go to um, the Pope Toledo factory in Toledo, Ohio. On that site, he oversaw the building of the Overland, Willie's Overland Modern Manufacturing Facility uh, in Toledo. Now, that facility, when they built that, that was considered to be the most advanced car manufacturing facility on the face of the earth at the time, when they built that brand new factory. Um, so Willie's bought, or Willis bought the, the Pope Toledo factory and then built the new facility, I guess, on that site and probably used some of the existing buildings as well. And the first year in Toledo, they built 12,000 cars at that facility. Now that's, so you went from 400 to 4,000 to 12,000. So he's, he's bumping the production up pretty hardcore and he employed like something over 20,000 people in the Toledo area, um, which was like a third of the population at the time. So they either worked for Willie's Overland or they worked for a subsidiary of that organization. Um, about, yeah, about 20, 20 so, 25,000 people are employed because of this decision, because of Mr. Willis, all right? And he's just getting started. So he continues buying companies. In 1911, he buys the Fisk Rubber Company, he buys the Graham Motor Truck Company, and the Gardford Manufacturing Company in 1912. Um, now, by 1912, uh, John North Willis owns 75% of Willis or Willis Overland stock. So he basically, he's the lion's share. He owns three quarters of the company. Um, and he has upwards of $2 million worth of investments and concerns identified with the motor industry. Um, and a total overall investment of over $20 million dollars in the industry as a whole, basically. So that's how much his shares are worth involved with various things that he's tied up in. Um, and he's also, by 1912, he's expanded it, their dealerships to where there's over 2,000 Overland dealers in the United States. Before they were having a very, very poor um, 
rate of being able to distribute the cars. So he revolutionizes that for the company. He acquires Edwards Motor Company of New York in 1913, which netted Willys Overland the license to manufacture the night sleeve engine, which this is where you get the, the Willys night cars. So he buys this company, Edwards Motor Company, because he liked this sleeved engine that they had. And so then they start making the Willys Knight models. He also has a controlling share in Global Ball Bearing Company of Norwich, Connecticut. Um, so he's getting the facilities to manufacture the cars. He's buying whole car manufacturers and he's buying the external pieces required to manufacture the car. So he's an empire man, I'm telling you. He, he acquires the electric auto light company and the Kinsley Manufacturing of Toledo were acquired in 1914. Um, he eventually sold off Graham and Carford uh, in 1915, but the Russell Motor Car Company of Toronto, Ontario, he purchased that in 1916. So this is, once again, why I have this, because he's just buying crap left and right. Um, from 1912 to 1918, Willys Overland is the second largest auto manufacturer in the world, okay? Ford's number one. Willys Overland went from a fledgling company just a handful of years earlier to the second largest in the world. And they did it with basically one factory. Now Ford, it doesn't have 75 factories at this time, but Ford was the mainstay that everybody's competing against at that time. In 1917, he films the Willis Corporation, uh, which was basically a holding company that would help with further expansion of his vast empire, right? So then he bought the Curtis Aeroplane, or Aeroplane and Motor Corporation, which was based out of Buffalo, New York. He enlarged the plant and contributed products to the war effort in World War I. So he's buying everything. He's getting it done. All right. So right after 1917, after he, after he buys this uh, Curtis Aeroplane and Motor Corporation, he buys the Moline, or Moline, but now you want to say a plow producer of Universal Tractors and Stevens Cars. He buys that. Um, he also buys New Process Gear Corporation. In 1918, he bought the Duesenberg plant in Elizabeth, New York, or New Jersey, and another in uh, another one in New York. He also acquired controlling interest in the United States Light and Heating Corporation in 1920. Now, keep in mind he's he's taken the company from nothing to building vast empire his names on it he owns 75 percent of the stock he owns the company right he the, the really the only hiccup that you have in this whole situation is there's a massive um, strike in 1919 which turned pretty violent and caused basically his plants to shut down for several months and that caused a hiccup in the whole chain of events um, and it costs the company millions of dollars in damages and labor-related problems. Um, but he eventually reorganizes the company enough to kind of get that under control. But then you have another recession that hits in 1920. Now, most people think of the Roaring Twenties, right? There's nothing going on. Well, there's, there's a series of little depressions and recessions, like I say, that are hitting all prior to the Great Depression. So there you have a, a, a fairly small but still significant at the time uh, recession hit 1920. And basically Willis, or Willis was in a position to where they're growing exponentially, but they've got a lot of money hanging out on the wrong end. So they're, the company's getting nervous the stockholders are nervous because the, the company you know, could go under easily if, if the wrong thing happens. So they bring in Walter Chrysler. Okay, this is before he founds the Chrysler Corporation, builds that empire. They bring him in um, to basically help reorganize Willis Overland. Um, he was the former vice president of GM, 
So they bring him in. He's got a lot of experience in situations like this. So they bring him in, and he's installed as the uh, executive vice president and general manager, manager of Willis Overland and Willie's Corporation. So he's, he's supposed to reorganize both of those things, both of those entities. Um, now, he does a fairly good job. He brings in his own engineers. They start designing this new six-cylinder engine that they want to use. Um, but it wasn't approved for production by the board, and they, Willis, Willis Overland didn't approve it. So he's trying to do things. Basically, from what I understand, this is what kind of slights Chrysler, and he decides he's going to seize control of Willis Overland. So he tries to shove John North Willis out of his out of basically his own company at this point, shove him out of it and take control of it. It doesn't work. It backfires pretty pretty terribly on him, and he is removed by 1921, 1922. It depends on what you read. Um, so once that whole fiasco is gone, Willis is back in control. He never really lost control, but he's back solidified in control, and he buys the F.B. Stearns, uh, Company of Cleveland, Ohio, which he purchased in 1925, which produced um, luxurious Stern night cars. That gives him basically kind of an end to the luxury market. So he'd already bought the Knight company earlier, but what you have is, is Knight was selling stuff. You had a lot of this with companies back in the day is that they would have they would sell certain parts of their products to different lines or different companies, and then they would produce certain things. So this company made Stern Knights. We already talked about the Willis Knight. So it, it's one of those companies that they've sold the rights to to this company, which produces basically luxury car called a Stern Knight. Um, he bought that, which gave him kind of a luxury car line. And then he continues production of that for about a decade. Uh, by 1928, Willis Overland is back into third place, largest manufacturer of cars, because um, it had kind of dropped down to the recessions and all that stuff. So it, it comes back as being third um, in the world. And at this point is when John North Willis retires. In 1929, he's gotten the company where he wants it. He's made plenty of money. He's got it. He's kind of set up. He retires in 1929 and actually sells his holdings in the company um, before the Depression. Now, I haven't read anything about this, but there was a lot of people that were able to figure out that they should sell their, their stocks before the Depression hit. I don't know that John North Willis is one of them, or if he just wanted to be done with it and he sold out, or if he could feel it coming, or he had insider information or what, but he goes ahead and sells out and keeps all his money intact, but he stays on the board of the company. So he sold, he stepped down as president and sold his shares of the company for about 25 million in 1929. Now, Herbert Hoover, President Herbert Hoover in 1932, appoints John North Willis as the first ambassador to Poland. Um, so this guy's, you know, he's come a long way. He's making a lot of money as a young man in his 20s, selling bicycles, gets into the car industry before he's even in his really his mid-30s, builds a vast empire, acquires all these companies, does that until 29, retires, makes $25 million off his sales, and then he... He was, he was a shrewd businessman, and he was known for this, so Herbert Hoover wants him to be ambassador to Poland. Now, the problem here is that by 1933, Willis Overland was in bankruptcy due to the Depression. Now, Willis Overland was in a better position than the vast majority of car manufacturers were when the Depression hit in 29, but even, even they couldn't handle it. So um, it goes into bankruptcy, and... John North Willis returns to try to save the company, but in 1933, the, cor the corporation entered bankruptcy, even with his attempts to save it. And it also was the end of the Willis Knight automobile at that same time. Um, now, he wasn't in exceptionally poor health, but he didn't have had a heart attack. 
Um, and he also went through a divorce in 1934, which was kind of startling at the time because he'd been married to the same woman, Isabel, um, for 37 years. And he just kind of randomly, they get a divorce, and then he marries another woman uh, relatively shortly thereafter. And that's who he's with until he dies. Um, in 1935, just prior to his death, he's named president of Willis Overland Motor Corporation again. Um, and the company emerges from bankruptcy in 1936. So he was able to save the company that he formed and started and got everything rolling. He was able to save it out of bankruptcy just prior to his death because he dies in 1935 because he'd had a heart attack and then he suffered a stroke while recovering from that heart In 1936, the reorganized Willis Overland Motors Company um, is basically back on firm ground. So, like I say, that's why there's so many dates and stuff to keep up with. So, and then you obviously know the rest of the story if you're into Jeeps, you know by, by the time the war comes around in 1939, um, Willis Overland is one of the ones contracted to make prototypes along with Bantam and along with Ford to make prototypes of uh, what we know as, as a Jeep, okay? Um, Willis Overland wins that contract um, kind of in a sleight of hand because Bantam actually produced the vehicle and met the requirements that the military wanted. They awarded the contract initially to Bantam, and then they said, well, you know, actually, never mind, and they kind of gave it to Willis Overland. And what became the MB, the military Jeep, is a combination of Ford's GP, what later would be the GPW, uh, Ford's GP design, Bantam's design, and Willis Overland's design kind of mashed together and it had the Willis Overland engine and drivetrain, but it had features from the Ford and from the Bantam. Now, you got to remember that Willie's was kind of cutting edge, right? So you had, um, whereas Ford was really hung up on producing four-cylinder car engines for a long time. Everybody else is already making six cylinders. There's cars out there with 12 cylinders, eight cylinders, all kinds of stuff. Willis was really big on making powerful smaller engines. So Willis produces what is now the famous Go, De uh, Go Devil L-Head 134 engine, which produced about 60 horsepower to 65 horsepower out of four cylinders. The famous flathead Ford V8 factory was producing around 90 to 100, 100 105 horsepower. They were getting more than half of the horsepower out of a four-cylinder with this L-head 134. So Willys was always kind of pushing the envelope on making advanced stuff at the time. And th that's really got more to do with why, Willy, why Willis gets the military contract for the Jeeps is because they really liked the drivetrain. Ford didn't even have an engine at that point that they were producing anymore that was a car engine to put in that Jeep, or what would become a Jeep. They were actually using tractor engines. And Willis already had this four-cylinder L-head that they'd been producing in the 30s, so they're like, well, you know, that'd be a good engine to put in the Jeep. And then they developed their drivetrain and everything else, and they just made just the sexiest hardcore rig in the world. And John North Willis would approve, because he'd already done stuff during World War I to help the United States during that war, and he certainly would have done things to help the United States during World War II and the Allies. So basically that's the cursory overview of John North Willis, Empire Man Extraordinaire, and thankfully because of him, if it wasn't for men such as John North Willis, we wouldn't have that Willis truck right there, which wouldn't lead us eventually to the CJ5 right here, which wouldn't have led you to any of the Jeeps that still exist today. Even though I shudder to call them Jeeps, but regardless, Willis got stuff done. Now we'll have to do another video eventually on the guy that actually is responsible for the design of my beloved Willis truck, which is a whole different dude who did all kinds of cool stuff and had a whole nother just, just empire man, you know. Um, 
but yeah i hope you enjoy this um this little it's a little different video a little bit of history on uh these jeeps that i'm always rambling about and about the man that made it possible because without john north willis there is no rec lake traveler channel there is none of that so i i i think it's good i, I appreciate john north willis uh, he got stuff done he's an empire man he saw the sea and he conquered it he reached all the way to the sea and he's an empire man so I wish he was here so we could have a cigar together and we could talk about this fine CJ5 right here. But if you enjoy this and you wanna see more videos about history related to the Jeeps and different things like that, and then please let me know in the comments. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already subscribed. Um, from my analytics, it appears that about 65 to 70 percent of the people that watch my videos aren't subscribed. So please consider subscribing. It helps my channel a lot. It helps it grow in the algorithm, gets it out there where more people can see it. Um, and if you have any more ideas for things you'd like to hear about involving anything history related, if you want to hear about uh, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, you want to hear about ancient Rome, you want to hear Greece, whatever, throw the topics down in the comments below. I will put a link um, to this article in the comments because um, like I say, I'm using it mainly as a reference for dates and stuff, but the full article is very good. So you should read the full article if you'd want to. I'll put that link in the description below so you can have a look at that. And because uh, there's a lot of other details that are kind of sorted in there. We just went over the major things that built Willis Overland. So until next time, until the next video, keep on keeping on. And don't forget, it's Willis for life. Cheap for life. Smoke them if you got them. Get it.